For the past six months or so, I've had a bottle of pills sitting on my desk at work, but I haven't taken them yet. The drug is Niaspan. It's a prescription drug that lowers cholesterol. And that's what my doctor recommended after two blood tests last year showed my cholesterol level inching up into the moderately dangerous level. And it's not an emergency yet, but the ordeal has me asking, to pop a pill or not to pop a pill? That is the question. <laughs> you see, on one hand, it's so easy just to reach for the little pink tablet, put it on my tongue, and wash it down with my morning coffee. But on the other, I'm embarrassed to resort to using processed chemicals with unpronounceable names that are manufactured at some factory in China to do what I should be doing naturally, like eating better, losing weight, and exercising. That's the correct way to stay healthy, right? But Ken, the pills are right there. It's so easy to reach for them. It's so quick and easy and even mindless. Some questions I have are, would I become dependent if I start taking these every day or addicted? What are the long-term consequences? And if I stop taking them, will my cholesterol be worse than ever? And how much is this going to cost? And is pain going to be involved? I guess the thing I'm wondering is an ethical question, and that question is, are pills a form of weakness? And I know questions like these don't stop Americans from taking them. Prescription drug use has quadrupled in the last 20 years. Americans spent $300 billion on legal drugs last year. And there are some people taking up to 17 prescribed drugs per day. And prescription drugs are accountable for at least 100,000 deaths in the U.S. every year as well. But still we take them. Pills seem to help because they make us numb. That's their purpose. They chill us out. They take away the edge. They stop pain and suffering. They smooth out all the conditions that are not considered normal. From a theological standpoint, God created our bodies well-connected and balanced and pure. When we come out of the womb and press the on button, everything is expected to work. For a variety of reasons, though, one organ sometimes loses its function or is harmed by an object it comes in contact with, or it's invaded, or it's abused. And sometimes you're not sure why something bad happens. But usually there's symptoms, and they build up. And before we know it, the body is sending out some kind of urgent distress signal that something is wrong and needs to be corrected. One of the main medical afflictions mentioned in the Bible is leprosy. And we see this both in the Old and New Testament. Moses' sister, Miriam, became a leper. And together with her older brother Aaron, they begged Moses to ask God to cure her. In 2 Kings, Naaman served as a general in the army, but fought a personal battle as well with leprosy. And then there's all the stories in the New Testament about Jesus and how he interacted with lepers. And maybe Jesus can help us today answer our hard questions about pills being a weakness because they make us numb. And we know this, that people...
misunderstand the type of disease that leprosy is, which is now also known as Hansen disease, after the gene that causes it was isolated in 1873. For one, it's not as contagious as it was once thought to be. Also, leprosy is not a skin disease per se, although many patients wind up with deformed skin lesions and malfunctioning bodies. <coughs> but the main symptom of leprosy is no pain. Leprosy affects the nervous system, not, uh, not, the, uh, outer si uh, not the inner system, but the periphery. So think about it. People can't touch. They can't feel. They lose their sensation of touch from skin to bone. The bacteria invades where the body temperature is at its lowest, usually at a person's palms or on the soles of their feet, and it works their way from the outside in. So an afflicted person can hold a boiling pot of water with a smile. They can walk on pieces of broken glass and never know that they're cutting their feet. Patients ignore the flowing blood. They'll keep burning their hands until a finger comes off. And incredibly, the American Medical Association still reports that there's about 25,000 active cases of leprosy, of Hansen's disease, in the United States today. So back to the Bible. Verse 11 of our scripture gives our setting, that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And he was traveling along the border between Galilee and Samaria. And that was a bold action in itself, because it was like walking along the border between Newark and Patterson, a place where the state puts all its prisons and insane asylums and lepers' hospitals. It's for the down and outers, not exactly your vacation destination. So Jesus enters this village, and in verse 12, he's met by 10 people who have active cases of leprosy. And these lepers kept their distance probably out of habit because nobody wants to deal with these people. They probably had badly deformed figures and were covered in sores. And not only that, all the races were mixed together. Samaritans usually kept separate from the Jewish people because the two groups didn't like each other. But as we know, disease doesn't dis dis discriminate. It cuts across all social classes with equal suffering. It's universal, just like sin. It attacks us all. And it's important for us to bring ourselves into this discussion because aren't we all prone to shortcomings and mistakes and disease, and calamity, and illness, and suffering, no matter how much money we make, or how good-looking or bad-looking we think we are. So these mixed-breed leper patients clearly had no place to belong to. They were outcasts from even their own families, even refused by slaves, and caretakers. However, since lepers are as intelligent as anyone else, their sense of distance must have been tremendous. Think of it. They couldn't feel physical pain, but they could feel the pain emotionally. I once knew a young cook at Lamberville Station Restaurant where I used to work. He was a kind, good-hearted person but his face was so severely scarred by childhood illness that, frankly, it was tough to look at him. 
His friendly personality is well suited to be out in front of the people as a food server. But because of his looks, he preferred to stay behind the scenes in the kitchen so he wouldn't have to endure the reaction of people as they looked at him. He was a prisoner locked up in an emotional hell. And I bet we have others here right this morning who have been feeling displaced or find themselves in some kind of self-imposed prison. And if it's not because of a physical shortcoming, then it might be because of loneliness or a past wrongdoing or by some kind of betrayal. Any type of emotional defeat. So the crux of the matter with these lepers, getting back to the Bible, was not a matter of pain. It was just the opposite. It was a matter of no pain. They couldn't feel the prick of a needle on their hand. They couldn't feel the warmth of a wash towel when they cleaned their face. They couldn't sense it when they got too close to a fire. And today, doesn't it seem like people have become numb to the same types of th things due to sin and wrongdoing? Just like lepers are numb to pain. In verses 13 and 14, the lepers call out to Jesus with a loud voice. Hey, Master Jesus, have mercy on me. Could you give me back our sense of touch, please? Could you make me feel some pain? We need to feel something. We need to feel anything. Please restore our sensibility. And we all know that when we pop a bunch, bunch of pills or drink one shot of liquor after another or abuse drugs, we get numb. We put ourselves in a dark place where we can't feel our pain. Because we only want to feel smooth things, nice things, pleasurable things. Let's admit it, we want to stay in a fog. We desire a euphoric state. The lepers, though, were just the opposite. They wanted to feel something. Hot, cold, rough, smooth, hard, soft, any kind of sensation. They were pleading to Jesus, give me some pain, sir. Please, restore our sensitivity. And as we ask, as perhaps we're sitting here, how much more numb does our society need to get? Because I don't know about you, but I'm numbed out to the max. I had to pull back from that. There's enough TV channels out there. There's enough different sports to watch. We have enough holidays to celebrate. Enough restaurants to choose from. Enough! And meanwhile, on our street, there's still homeless. There's still people in the world who are suffering things we don't even hear about. So when the leper uh, sees Jesus in verse 15, Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they said that, they realized that they became clean. Immediately, miraculously, they were restored to full health. Which means they began to feel something. The itchiness returned to their feet. The sharp stones under their uh, soles made them hop and jump around. They could feel the breezes blowing. And compassion was on. Because feeling something for them wasn't something to be avoided. In this case, feeling was good. It was welcome. How many times have we heard a person say, when something good happens, oh, pinch me. I gotta know if this is real. I wanna know if I'm alive. So I ask, don't we wanna feel something in our lives instead of being numb? Don't we wanna stay aware rather than 
being a father. So I put before you, we should be grateful for the small doses of pain we endure, because that's God's way of alerting us when things are either good or bad, or nice or ugly, pleasurable or nasty. It's God's way of utilizing the five senses we were given. God's way of showing us that something is going on inside of us and outside of us. The shepherd boy David, who grew up to be a king in Psalm 23, said, Lord, restore my soul. And that sounds like a good prayer to me, but hey, I'm, I'm informal uh, I'm a 21st century person. We can just shout it out. Dear God, get me off this numbness. Get me off of this cycle. Let me feel some pain. In verse 15, one person, just one of the ten former lepers, comes back to thank Jesus. And he probably summoned up all his courage to do so, hobbling up to Jesus and saying, Oh, wow, wow, uh, ouch, man, Jesus, these stones are hard. But his thank you was sincere. And by verse 16, he's saying, Lord, thank you for giving me pain. I feel the hot sun on my face. I feel this belt wrapped around my waist. I feel the coolness of this bowl of water. And he didn't curse Jesus because he was still walking with a limp. He wasn't embarrassed because he recognized that his speech was now slurry because he'd become aware. He didn't mind shielding his eyes from the sun because those were his first experiences with physical pain. And because of it, he was full of thanksgiving and joy. Who among us would ever thunk to thank God for feeling pain. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk says, Lord, I don't care if the fig tree doesn't bloom this year. I don't care if the fields produce no food, but I will rejoice because I know you are my God of strength, my God of comfort, of healing, and salvation. And in verses 17 and 18, while only one leper comes forward to thank Jesus, the other nine scatter. They can't summon up the words. Maybe pride got in their way. Maybe embarrassment was too great. But they all felt pain for the first time as well. And in verse 19, Jesus says, get up and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And there's no fanfare, there's no brass band and roses. He just says, go and be grateful. So friends, I think this shows where faith really starts. That in the beginning, when the Genesis starts, the only person Jesus needs to make your life work is you. When you come to Jesus with a grateful heart. You don't need any spectators to gather around. You only need to stand before Jesus and be grateful. And be grateful that perhaps the, for the first time in a long time, instead of being numb, that you're actually feeling some pain. And we give out like this not because we want to remain numb, but because we want to feel Instead of being numb, we want to feel God's righteousness and God's love working through us as human beings. And a Christian's pain is fruitful pain, because just like those lepers, just like the prophet Habakkuk, or just like any of us who have experienced it, we know we have God's promise delivered to us, even as we are enduring that pain. So in closing, let's present our request to God while we 
still have pain. During our moments of uncertainty and during times of stress, let's thank God. We know Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, making his last trip, getting closer and closer to the cross. And even acutely aware of the bitter pain that he would have to endure. And how fitting to think, perhaps Jesus, during this moment of suffering on the cross, borrowed what came out of the poor leper's mouth and repeated it back to God when he said, thank you.